Welcome teachers. We are here with our next edition of Spill the Tea in 10. I am so glad that you are here with me. So are you ready for today's topic? Every Wednesday at 4 p.m. I get the unique privilege of answering questions from this audience of proficiency-oriented teachers, questions about their instruction, and we talk about it in a quick chat in 10 minutes. So if you're down for it, let's get started. All right, we got the timer on. We're good to go. Today's question is a juicy one. I got this on Instagram and it's really interesting. So it's definitely worth diving into. We could do a whole hour long thing about it, but in just 10 minutes, I want to give you a few things to think about if you're wondering what is the real role of grammar in my proficiency oriented classroom? Boom. I know it's a big one. So welcome. I know. Put on your big girl pants and your big boy pants and your non-binary pants because it's about to get serious up in here. And that's why I brought my tea today because it's spilled the tea in 10. This is kombucha in my minions cup. All right, let's get to it. We've only got a little bit of time. We're talking today about how do we fit in the expectations of teaching grammar when we want to teach for proficiency, or maybe this could be through a couple different lenses. Do you think that grammar is important in your classroom, but you're hearing conflicting messages about it in the comprehensible input oriented world? Or maybe you're thinking, should I just get rid of it altogether? Let's chat about it. The first thing that I want to make sure that we lay out flat is this word grammar. We all know that when we start discussing an important topic, that terms and vocabulary is one of the first things that we should make sure that everybody's on the same page about. When you use the word grammar, let's all be clear that in our world, linguistically, grammar is a shorthand term for something so incredibly complex that we still don't understand fully how it works in our brains. The systems of language are so incredibly complicated. It's like studying the brain because it is a product of the brain. So grammar is just a reflection of all of the systems involved in grammar, not just verbs, which is usually what comes to mind with that. But we're talking phonetics, morphology, all that good stuff. And I have a full blog post about it for you, whether you're a French or Spanish teacher, you can find out more about it here because we don't have time to dive into that super interesting topic today. But know that grammar is a shorthand word for something incredibly complex. So if you're thinking about what's the role of grammar in your classroom, understand that when you're teaching just the simple features and properties of language, and we boil that down to grammar, uh, we can't even begin to really cover it. We're just talking about the patterns that we're able to see, but we don't really fully understand them. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Because a common misconception about language learning, about language acquisition and language teaching is that when you understand the features of language and how they work, then that must mean that I will be able to use the language better, right? When it's time to actually speak or write listen, whatever. And we know that if you're on this proficiency train, that's actually not the case. There's a ton of research to back that up. Got another blog post for you here to talk more about that. But there's still some disconnect between how the teaching, we'll just call it teaching the properties of language, like introducing the properties and features of language, call it grammar, to students. How effective is this? How much should we be doing it? Oh, and you know, that ever constant pressure, if you teach in this situation where people are telling you that you have to do this and you're not sure where it's going to fit into your curriculum. So I got a few suggestions for you. Okay. So we talked about how grammar is not really actually grammar. So keep that in mind when you're teaching and that some students will ask for it because their parents are used to seeing it a lot. Um, they, I mean, they're stakeholders that, that it's still a really common myth around what it means to acquire a language that you need to understand the features in order to really grasp it. Also, if you are a language person, like remember, only 2% of your students really will be only 2% of your students think like us, think like language teachers and want to know how the language works. Think of it as like if you were teaching 
your kid how to drive a car, only 2% of them want to know how the engine works. The rest of them just want to learn how to drive, right? I don't, I don't give a you know what about how my engine works. I just want it to roll. But when it comes to language, oh man, I would be taking that engine apart because I care a lot about language. Keep that in mind for your students. Some of them will ask. Give it to them if they ask. However, you can avoid a lot of these problems and potentially even, you know, friction. I don't even want to say conflict, but sometimes there's friction between differing points of view on this when it comes to department meetings and curriculum expectations for to include grammar or not to include grammar, because there is this prevailing myth that grammar equals rigor in a world language classroom false, but that's another topic we don't have time to talk about today. So if you are in this position where you don't really want to fight that battle, or you're maybe even, you know, leaning that way yourself, or you just want to teach some grammar, whatevs, here's how you can go about it. It will be a lot easier for you to even just avoid that whole mess if you have a truly well-constructed and well-organized curriculum map. Because the natural progression and patterns of what you'll see in either, if you're teaching outside of the US, any most international standards use CEFR, the natural progressions of language outlined in CEFR, if you're following those, then all of the language features that you need at the right time are included in order. The next thing is that if you're teaching inside the US, like I previously had experience with, then ACTFL does the same thing. No language features are specifically mentioned because that's not the focus, but you will, your students will need to actively use them in context in order to achieve those goals. So if you have a really well outlined curriculum map that's following those two different system standards, then you'll be fine and you don't have to worry that much about teaching, like over teaching explicit grammar, really. If you are in the position where you have to teach explicit grammar for whatever reason, you want to, you're being pressured to, you're curious about whether it's necessary or not. Here's something that you can do to still make it work with your proficiency oriented goals. Because as we just talked about, there's no explicit grammar in, I repeat, there is no explicit grammar mentioned in any proficiency oriented or frankly modern, it blows my mind, modern standards for language acquisition in the world, in the world, CEFR or ACTFL, none of them mention any kind of explicit grammar. So let that be a little bit of a red flag to you. But if you feel that this is a part of your curriculum that's important, then you can do a grammar boot camp. I did this a couple times with my French ones and twos, especially because, hello, if you have students that are moving into a different style uh, or approach to teaching, or maybe they have an exam that has a lot of explicit grammar and language features on it, like the AP or the IB exam, then don't leave them out to dry. Teach them the features that they need to know. Teach them those. And you can do that in something called a grammar boot camp. Plus, if they've had a ton of input from you and proficiency-oriented opportunities for meaningful output, then they will be very ready to receive this information and they will learn it so much faster. So this is what a grammar boot camp looks like. You pause your normal instruction for a little bit and you teach in whatever way you want to, the grammar that you normally wouldn't really mention or go over. You just start to mention and organize all of those language features, grammar properties, whatever you want to call them, in class. And you can even just call it a boot camp. Like I did all the French ER verbs one week during quarantine because I was just completely out of energy. And I already had all of those materials from a few years back of teaching. So it's way easier for me to upload those. It was fine. And I knew that my students would need them at some point if they were taking a college entrance exam, because those are still very, you know, explicit language features heavy. So you can do that. You can also do in your grammar boot camp, like for a week or two, or even just a few days, you can do pop up grammar, which is a really cool way of saying, hey, we're going to see this in a story that we're about to read. We're about to use a lot of the term nous. Nous 
is when it's you and me together. So let's see how this works and a couple example sentences. And let's talk about what subject pronouns are because we haven't really actually mentioned that that much this year. This is what subject pronouns are. This is what they mean in English. Here's some other examples in French that you've seen a lot. Let's break it down. And guess what? In five minutes, after your students have seen the word je, tu, il, and elle, and on, after they've already seen it a million times from you speaking to them, they, it, it'll just click. They'll be like, oh, that's like the word we in English, or that's like the word they? Got it. No problem. And they'll move on. It's actually way easier and way simpler than what I used to do is introduce subject pronouns at the beginning of the year thinking they're going to use this in every sentence. They need this all the time. I should teach it first because it's the most important word. They need it in every sentence. And guess how long it took to teach subject pronouns? Oh my God, weeks, right? But when they saw it in context a ton of times, and then at the end of all those contextualized exposures to input, I said, hey, these are subject pronouns. This is how they work. And this is how they're aligned in English. It only took five minutes to teach the concept. Boom, done. You can tell that that's how, that was one of the moments I was sold on proficiency-oriented instruction. And in my notes here, I have a last one for you. Look this one up if you haven't seen it before, but this is a total gem for, especially when you have required things that you need to teach, uh, like maybe difficult tenses, irregulars, things like that, uh, masculine, feminine, which is just a doozy in any romance language. Inductive grammar. Inductive grammar is when you treat the grammar concept like a mystery. You give students a couple in context, context examples of it and see if students can figure out what the rule is. What's the rule? How are they supposed to apply it? Don't ask them to, you know, produce it, but what's the rule? How do they apply it? What does this mean in French or Spanish? And then you and work as the facilitator of the discussion and the students are like the investigators. And at the end, if you figure out the rule, then they win. It's called inductive grammar. It's a lot of fun. My final thoughts for you is that like all comprehensible input teaching things, that when it comes to explicit features of language, shorthand grammar, as we like to refer it, you know, the like linear verb charts that we see in our uh, grammar syllabus, that kind of deal. It's a huge mindset shift, huge mindset shift that think about grammar is just another tool in your tool belt that helps your students along the line, but it is no longer the vehicle. And frankly, it never was. It is not the vehicle for learning or what we know better to be as acquisition. It's honestly not even the tire on your vehicle. It's more like the AC in your car, if we're going with the six, seven metaphor of a vehicle. So your vehicle, if everybody's hopping in and learning a language with you and you're helping them, your tires are other things, but grammar does make it easier. You know, AC makes it easier, but you could honestly roll without it. However, it's a tool. Why not use it, right? So grammar is not your enemy, but there are still differing opinions on how important, how little importance it has, all that good stuff. Look into that for yourself and see what really makes sense for you right now in your season of teaching. But at the end of the day, do understand that when you're teaching for proficiency, everything about it is a mindset shift. And that's what's beautiful about it. You're making learning so much more accessible to so many more students this way. Thank you so much for joining me for this. I hope that you learned something and that you loved it. Let me know in the comments below what is your favorite way to talk about language features in class and what do you think has worked for you in the past? Do you have any questions? Put those in the comments below too. Or you can be like this teacher and reach out to me on Instagram at La Libre Language Learning. I would love to hear from you. We do this every Wednesday, so come and hang out. And if you love more practical ways to make your world language practice more proficiency oriented with all the magical comprehensible input glitter that you need to make it sparkle, then hang out with me more often. I'd love to see you here, either in this Facebook group and all the different ways that we can connect. Thank you so much for being here. This was a lot of fun. I could chat about grammar all day and I hope that you could too. But for now, I'll see you next Wednesday. Au revoir.